we are at the top of the hour here. You know, we always do kind of a show and tell if people have things to show. And then I also have a bunch of slides uh, over three visits and I can, we can either start with show and tell, or we can start with a presentation. Let me know what you guys think. Well, since I have to leave early, um, maybe I could show this one if that's okay. Yeah, let me uh, enable screen sharing. I forgot to do that. Okay, everybody should be able to uh, share their, do, do a screen sharing at this point. Okay. So let's see here. Yeah, there you, right, yeah, there you we see go. the watch? Yeah. Yep, it's okay. upside down, but that's a nice, nice uh, dynamic. Okay, now <laughs> right. let me see. Oh, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> but anyway, if you watch the second hand, you see the erratic movement of the, yeah, What yeah, is yeah. causing that? What's that about? <laughs> There's, uh, it's probably an indirect uh, seconds drive on that thing. So yeah. there's a little friction spring on the pinion that um, drives that the second hand is attached to. And if that friction pin is missing, then you can get some bouncing of that hand. Huh. Uh, and that's possible what's, what's going on with that erraticness. I see, huh, well. Yeah, it's um, it's just a strange thing, you know. It's it looks like it's okay for a couple of seconds, then all of a sudden it hesitates. So there's basically some slack in the gear train and uh -huh. slack between the teeth, and you've got a big gear driving a little teeny pinion on the far end of that second hand, and so the play in the teeth of the gear can result in that erratic looking. To me, that's a lot more likely. It's 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 unlikely that you're missing the pin, so I, I think it's slop in your in your mechanism. Well, mm. it's it's there's always slop in the in the gear, but there's always a little beryllium copper spring that touches on that thing, and sometimes it pushes from the top, sometimes it's a, a leaf spring that pushes from the side, and sometimes it's a spring that. Uh, is like a fork and it pushes up from the bottom and it's a very weak spring just enough to stop the second hand so that you don't get that bouncing between the teeth and resulting in that erratic motion well there it is <laughs> that's my that's my show and tell i also have well, that it's that a nice, one that you've seen it's a nice the, the, looking watch uh, tim what vintage is it i don't know actually uh i haven't had i i have not had the back off of it and so i can't don't know the serial number or any of that kind of stuff uh but i like the looks of it so yeah i bought it so nice. you, you but can, i don't have a lot of omegas you can date it uh from the serial number on the omega museum website ah. you can you can do a Google search or an internet search on the Omega Museum and, and you can find a spot to enter it. That particular watch often was on a leather or plastic band as well. And I think it was a 70s vintage watch, if I'm not mistaken. And they did three in incarnations, I believe, of the uh, Omega Dynamic. And they ended with a, a chronograph that I had one of that I sold to Terry Jones, who's on this session and i think that they're they're fun watches a little underappreciated because of their odd looks to them yep well that's all i have i do have that other one you know it's a little uh uh little rectangular watch that you know you have seen tim you know that has yep. a terrible terrible job of repaint on the logo on the watch face so i didn't uh that one is really terrible looking, so I didn't uh, didn't put that up here. Okay. All the, right. So anyway, that's all I got. Welcome to everybody that has joined. Sean, Terry, Jeff Wright, <coughs> yeah, anybody, and Jack Pardon. Wood down there. Has anybody yeah. got anything else they 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 want to show here? Should we do your your tour first and and then show? Because okay, we we can we can do. It. Here we go. Okay, so we are at the bus stop for in front of the uh, Omega factory in VLBN. I don't remember the name of the street that it's on, but it's serviced by a bus. And if you go to VLBN to visit Omega, you can 
catch the bus from the train station to the museum or you can walk it's probably about a half hour walk and with google maps you should be able to get there just fine so this is the museum from or the uh, factory from the street side and it is actually a very large complex and extends farther to the back uh, for quite a ways this is more administrative stuff this is the museum the museum is on the upper floor the lower floor with the umbrellas is actually the employee's um lunchroom you know, tim, kind tim, of, tim yes can I interrupt can yes you tell us when, what years these were uh, slides were made i took um i've been there three times the first time was in 2010 and i believe this is probably 2010 vintage and then i was there again in 2016 for several days because i was visiting their minstrom factory and then i was there again in 2018 also visiting our minstrom for a few days thank you yeah. thanks so you'll actually see some museum exhibits that are um, the same thing, but arranged a little differently. <laughs> Hopefully it, it won't be too boring. So they got a little sign there. And inside, it's the museum is free. And you can actually get a guided tour in any language. You have to arrange that in, in advance, but it doesn't it didn't cost us anything in 2010, the first year that we went there. I will say that most of the museum guides are chosen for their linguistic skills, not because of their horological skills. So if you're looking uh, to, to learn a lot, you might be better off on your own or finding somebody who's, who's a watchmaker to uh, give you a, a tour through the facility. But again, it's free and you can go in during any time that it's open and linger as long as you want. So this is uh, Lewis Brandt's workbench and he was the founder of Omega and he actually started the company as Lewis Brandt in something in Chauffons and he was in 1847 I believe and he was assembling pocket watches from existing parts which was a common thing at the time you would get parts um, from various little home manufacturing people that were specializing in just specific parts and then you would finish them and put a watch together and and lewis would assemble watches and then travel uh, through europe in a stagecoach selling them and it was only later on that the factories got built by his sons and distribution got going. But anyway, they have his workbench and they show examples of, of parts of, of a pocket watch and some patents. This is a patent on a motor barrel, which you know, I be believe was like, I, don't, I can't quite read the date, whether it's 18, some late 1800s or early 1900s. And they have some tools on display and they talk about sister brands. And I've seen some of these watches and I, and I think I might have some of these movements. I never knew that they were, you know, came out of the Lewis Brandt's uh, workshop in, in Chauffons. They don't have a whole lot of history because there was a fire of which happened a lot and the uh, records were destroyed. There doesn't seem to be a... Uh way to raise one's hand to ask a question so well just uh just uh, unmute yourself it's and under, ask a question. it's under reactions it is yeah they moved it oh yeah they did there there i raised my hand <laughs> okay i see your hand jack speak up oh. i so, so i'm familiar with with two of these sister brands uh patria and Reg regina or as the our friend from the southern hemisphere would say regina <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I pronounced that right. <laughs> Anyways, the uh, Patria was almost exclusively Abishay movements where he was, where they were using uh, a range of other makers. Yes. Casing them under the Patria name, whereas the uh, Regina, Regina, however you want to pronounce it, uh, those were Omega movements, uh, as far as I can tell, at least in, in the period that I've been collecting, which is around. Uh, World War One, and uh, 
they're they're identical to the Omega marked movements, other than the name. And from what I can tell, they were uh, exclusively marketed in Canada. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. I'll put there my hand up now. No problem. So these are some pictures of of some of the watches in that that display, talking about the sister brands. And uh, now we get into the chronograph. So they released uh, their first chronograph in the late 1890s or middle 1890s, I believe. And so there's some examples of them. We get in, these are all Masonic themed watches. Omega, once they got going by the, the second generation sons and beyond, they focused a lot both on switching to large volume manufacturing using manufacturing machinery and interchangeable parts. They focused on accuracies and they were submitting for time trials. And then they were also doing a lot of jewelry stuff as well. And they competed in jewelry competitions in, in France, in Paris. And these are more vintage pieces. And again, some of the, examples of the case making and and ornamental work is 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 pretty significant they really put a lot of effort in, into the jewelry side of things probably made them more money it was a mix of yeah they they became the biggest company in switzerland by the 1890s they had 600 people and were producing about 100,000 watches a year, I believe. And I'm sort of paraphrasing things from the um, an Omega book that I have here. And Tim, now we're starting, go, go on. Yeah, yeah back, back a few frames. There was one on the bottom left that, um, well, it's, it's in that, that one you just passed by too. On the left there, that looks like um, they would have worn it through a buttonhole, or what is that um, chain? Not a chain, though. Looks like it's well, it's, it's, it certainly does look like something that you would uh, put in a in a button, or could put in a buttonhole. But uh, to me, it looks just very much like some highly decorated um, case watch, and these might have been during the Egyptian period when uh, there was a lot of interest in Egyptian um, things, but um, that, I think that would have been considered more of a watch that you would have put in your purse or carried in a pocket, or maybe you would have even, if that was an elastic strap, you could have sort of hung it around your wrist, but, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So we're getting into some more familiar looking pieces here. Of course, there's endless uh, decorative watches that I've taken pictures of. And these are probably, I would, I'm guessing between 20s and 50s. I haven't bothered um, to actually date any of these things or research them. This one is sort of talking about um, precision and in, in the background. So I think here we're starting to get into some higher accuracy things. So in the 18, I think it was 1817, the uh, British um, military contracted with Omega for watches based on, I think, the 30T2 movement. And a couple of years later, the US Army started doing the same thing. But uh, this is, um, I've sort of done this by um, military and then I'll get into uh, their, their Olympic stuff. Okay, now we're getting into the Olympic timers. Omega got into the Olympics in 1931, I believe, and started a period of about 60 years of continuous um, Olympic timing. Um, <clears throat> leadership. In 1970, I think it was 72, they entered a partnership with Long Jeans because the Japanese were uh, coming on so strong, they were concerned about uh, losing 
uh, <clears throat> losing their their sports timing dominance and so they the two companies start started a company together called i think sports timing corporation or something and so they have a lot of displays in regards to the olympic timers and early timing technologies that uh, they had developed and they were using guns to start the timers and uh, some tv clock there this might have been their they did the first um swimming um system where if you when you hit the paddle the pads at the end of the lanes it would it would stop the uh the stopwatches and i think there was an eight lane system that they were the first ones to come out with and some of these watches uh, the big thing on the left they sometimes call that the albatross that was released for an olympic trial and i think some of those are commemorative watches more more stopwatches and what's interesting with this is you see some skeletonized stopwatches these big split second high, highly jeweled movements were or stopwatches are, are fairly expensive even on on the used market uh, today the plain ones are you know well over 500 to to several thousand depending on their provenance and you see skeletonized versions of those same things. And I've seen some of those sell at, at auctions in the last two years. They're, 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 they're quite the collector's pieces. This is uh, getting into uh, some of their waterproof dive stuff. And they came out with um, this early waterproof double case system. And they have a little display of that. And they have a display dedicated to Jacques Cousteau, who used Omega products, and he used up on the right hand, you see their a 1974 vintage Omega Marine chronometer. They released that after a very long development period, uh, just in time to see the market collapse and uh, the Japanese uh, quartz onslaught was going full bore at that point. Now we're getting into the Speedmaster professionals and uh, the astronaut stuff. So they have this display that uh, I'll just blast through. And uh, down in the, by the stairs going up, they have a replica of the moon buggy as well, but I didn't get a picture of that. <coughs> So they've got a little bit of a moon rock there, I think, and some gloves and some of the watches that have uh, gone into space. So this is kind of the same display minus the glove. So I think the first one was 2010 and this last one was 2018. So they changed you know, the displays and moved things around. Would they have had something to do with the development of the moon buggy? No, they didn't. Uh, the only thing that uh, Omega contributed to the, the the moon project was the watches. And they basically got that because they're the ones that survived all the trials. Number of companies, including Americans, had provided watches to NASA for trials. And only the Omega Hesalite plastic crystal was the one that managed to stay in during vacuum and other um, test things. Others movements either stopped or the crystals came out uh, under temperature extremes and vacuum, but the Omega hung in there. And that's why they won the contract. And they have this console as part of the display and it's uh, got a NASA property tag on it still. Yeah. And these are more of some of their kind of tool watches. Uh, the big watch on the back to the right with the red ring around it that's a low temperature arctic edition watch and you can buy a collector's version of that thing and i thought this uh, attachment uh, for starting and stopping a wrist chronograph was something else the watch on the left is their 
um, tuning fork based chronograph they call it the speed sonic lobster and that was a real collector's watch for a while and i went kind of overboard on collecting those things and this is a redo redoing of that particular display and then of course uh, james bond uh, was became important form and i think is 1969 uh, when uh, James Bond switched from a Rolex to a Mega and has stayed with a Mega, but there's also other watches in James Bond movies, including Seiko quartz watches and such. The Gruen. Yeah, <laughs> Gruen. So this is a display of some of their chronometers. They did small deck chronometers and the big watch uh, pocket watch in the round ring down below is uh, one of these chronometer trials watches and i think this one got the highest prize awarded out of the q observatory trials and so they're very proud of that one and uh, i think that was probably their their best watch that they had ever 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 adjusted and they had one adjuster that was well known and produced the winning watches uh, in most of these competitions. So another more pictures of them. Sorry that uh, this, these aren't cycling faster. The, uh, they also did railroad kind of watches and they did a lot of these things in wood boxes that are like a large uh, chronometer, uh, railroad chronometer, but it's, it's in a box that would sit on a desk. And these are some observatory uh, chronometers. You see the aluminum cases and such, those were allowed the watches to be changed in positions easily by the people running the chronometer trials. And just more pictures of some of their special chronometer observatory trial watches and more odd shaped things. Uh, Seiko did some watches that had shapes similar to this as well as for their observatory trials for wristwatch size things. And this is actually a um, 30 T2 chronometer movement. And this is actually a, an advertising piece of paper that uh, you sometimes see at auction. And then these are some of these particular watches using the 30 T2 chronometer movement. And there's a one in person and uh, a nice example of, of their chronometer watch there. So, uh, this particular watch has a, a frictionless magnetic escapement and you look at the escape wheel and it's got this particularly odd star shaped uh, thing except so this now tim or you're talking about the erratic um, movement of your second hand you see this big gear on the back side that's driving a little pinion in the center and that it's the play between those two gears that causes that that wobble and there's a spring underneath this that tries to put a little bit of friction on that center wheel to stop the wobble and a little discussion of the frictionless um, escapement and the clifford escapement i think that's possible that might have been either british yeah i think it was an it was an english um, development and these are some dive watches moving into the contemporary uh, more 70s styled funky dress watches and other types of shapes some of these you may see all i think these are all quartz and more displays i'll try and these are some clock kinds of displays uh, more technical kinds of of timing things again using wrist watches not sure why but there's reasons behind them all. Yeah, this must be a Speedmaster, more uh, Speedmaster. I apologize for my computer running rather slow um, in terms of cycling through slides. I was hoping to be able to do this more quickly. So obviously a lot of uh, Speedmaster stuff. Now we're getting into their Flightmaster and the Flightmasters was another popular watch uh, during the 70s. The first one was done for a South American Air Force um, contract. I forget if it was Argent, 
Argentina or Peru, I think is Argentina, and it was actually a Railmaster uh, magnetic resistant watch that uh, got, you know, with a pilot's dial on it. And then they, they started designing these um, crazy uh, pilot's watches. There's a book, Flight Master Only book out there. It's a collector's book. And I actually got a copy of this book given to me at the museum the last time I was there. And uh, more more highly stylized watches here. Kind of the, those are all bracelet bangles, women's watches, artist series kinds of things. A little quartz watch here or getting into quartz stuff. So the square watches on the left are there. Omega Marine chronometers. Um, the two watches on the back are Beta 21, which was a early joint development between a bunch of Swiss companies for a quartz movement. The two LED watches down on the lower right are actually have American LED movements in them. And they did artist uh, watches as well, which was kind of a popular thing in the 70s i believe as well i don't know the actual dates of these and these are some really crazy decorative watches no time displayed on this one i guess just just you just get to watch the tourbillon go around and around so again these are their early quartz 1974 as i said is when they released the first versions of these watches there's also when the Swiss industry was in a very serious decline. And during that same 1974 period, Omega actually started destroying a lot of inventory. They had overbuilt so much inventory and the, and the demand for it was collapsing so much. You know, I guess tax laws or other things, they decided to write them off and they destroyed, you know, a lot of things that'd be real collector's items now and a display of the coaxial movement, which they now use on most of their mechanical watches. Uh, this is, I thought was an interesting display on showing different layers of movements and cases uh, on different planes of a lucite. We're getting into some modern things. They show some of the dials, uh, designs that they have done, ceramic case rings, that are processed and machined in in-house, showing the various stages of uh, case production when they're using ceramic materials. They have a lot of displays of their basic movements. And so it's kind of interesting if you're curious of some specific movement, uh, they'll, they have them on this display. And in the center here is a beta 21 movement, which was, that joint development with the Swiss, and it's a fairly complicated thing. The movement on the right is uh, the first movement for their first uh, marine chronometer wristwatch. And this is a clock movement. This is a deadbeat second clock beating movement, which is a really nice clock, and I won't dwell on that too much. But these are other clock movements. The one on the left is uh, a real common eight-day movement you see a lot and Omega clocks, and the one on the right is an alarm clock movement, and um, another large, um, this would be a simple stopwatch movement, and this would be a split second stopwatch movement, another stopwatch movement. Again, On these are, are large pocket size, and this is an interesting display piece that they would have had in you know, at a, at a trade show or something. And these I thought were interesting, more of these super thin quartz movements uh, at the time when everybody was trying to show how thin they could go. And so this one, the case is, you know, basically part of the movement or, or the case is the movement bridge. And very early transistorized quartz clocks. And these are back some early uh, chronometer movements. Uh, these are railroad watch size movements that you would see Canadian railroads used uh, Omega. The Canadians allowed Swiss watches, foreign watches on their railroads. The Americans required American made watches. This, um, you'll see on, on these higher grade Omega chronometer movements, uh, the grade DDR and 
other grades designations and those tend to be pretty rare if you see one at at a uh, flea market or something you definitely want to grab it because they're worth thousands this is a uh, bulkhead clock that uh, were used on submarines i picked up one of these off ebay a number of years ago that supposedly came out of a french submarine that the canadians uh, were going to scuttle and uh, they stripped some things out of the submarines before they sank them and some of these have been in the nawcc discussion boards uh, saying the same thing but i haven't been able to find any evidence that the canadians actually scuttled any of the french submarines the french scuttled some of their own and the ones that didn't get scuttled, uh, a lot of them were actually put into service by the French resistance. So don't know the real story behind them. Now, moving on to a different museum, there's a big machine tool company based in, in BLBN named Mueller, Mueller Machine Tools. And they have a museum that is available on um, reservation only. You it's not generally open to the public. And I we arranged a, a tour of this um, in 2010. In 2010, it was my first trip to Switzerland. And so we used a travel agent to do our book, book our tour and got to go see this. Our tour guide was actually a retired Hauser uh, jig bore service guy that serviced the Bullion factories in the United States. And so he was a good English speaker, obviously. Have a lot of um, these different machines. I focus on ornamental machines because that's my interest. And this is a straight line, um, automated straight line machine. These decorative machines were early, um, basically early mechanical CNC machines. They would... Um, what vintage, Tim? Do you know? These are based i believe would be in the 30s perhaps okay. i think they're 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 after the turn of the century these these are this particular one is what they call a brocading machine and this actually has two sets of patterns and i've took a bunch of pictures of this one that's the the work holder this would have held a, a watch case back typically and a whole bunch of gear driving on it but there's two things you see here on the right in the center, you see this uh, Bakelite disc with a pattern on it. Yeah. And there's a follower that a pin that follows that surface and that moves a cutter up and down on the watch case that would have been clamped in that clamp in the previous slide earlier. And then on the right, you see these bronze rosettes that have a pattern on it and those would give you that wavy pattern that is the background pattern on the case so you'll often see in watch cases a pattern you know some sort of shield or something uh, in the case with a background field of, of a, what they call a barley corn pattern and this machine could generate those automatically um, there were the I'm sure they were really difficult to set up, but once they got set up, uh, they really could crank out um, beautiful cases. Guys, what's the difference between a chronometer and a railroad watch highly jeweled? Would they just not put that term when it's an American made railroad watch? Um, if that was a question to me, I didn't have my headphones on. Yeah, I was just asking generally, um, what's the difference then between a chronometer and a highly jeweled railroad watch? Um, pro well, I think the chronometer uh, ratings or when something said chronometer would often have been <coughs> certified as a chronometer uh, where they would have gone through some sort of third party trial and tested it and verified that it ran at chronometer rates. They were also that term was used if you had a chronometer escapement like a detent escapement like you'd see in marine chronometers. And sometimes people just said chronometer. I mean, I have some very inexpensive dollar pocket watches or seven jewel watches that say chronometer on the dial, but you know, it 
<laughs> Obviously, it was not a chronometer. So just showing more of the gear works. These things were fairly complicated because these followers had to move across the surface of both that Bakelite pattern that they were duplicating onto the watch case. And then they also had to move the cutter across the surface of the watch case. And the watch case was curved so that the cutter had to change its angle to the face and its position you know, as it went around. So these were pretty sophisticated machines. And I don't know how many you know, are available in the general tool market. A lot of these machines have either been bought by collectors and some have been bought up by manufacturers to either be put into use or taken out of service so that nobody else can use them. And that's kind of a thing that, that the Swiss will do is, is buy machinery to keep competitors from using it and just more of the, the controls on. It. And this is another somewhat similar, simpler ornamental machine. And this possibly might've been done used for dial decorating because it's, it's, it's a fairly simple. This is a large stamping press. So there's uh, a big worm gear drive that goes down um, in the center there and then a, uh, a drive wheel on the side and they've got a mannequin down at the bottom showing how he would have been working and they would have stamped out big pieces like this. Uh, they would use this for stamping out watch bridges and other things as well. This is a little miniature and this was actually a functional uh, model. This box was probably three feet square with little miniature screw machine lays and and drill presses and surface planers and other things and they could turn it on and all these things would, would run it was really kind of cute so that's the end of that museum and now we're going into a um, this is a store that sells watch materials and tools and it, it's a really great store and Harley was actually the original founder of the store and he's 80 and has sold it to this Italian gentleman which I'm not going to try and pronounce, but uh, Mr. Harley is still at the store on a nearly daily basis, uh, at least in, in 2018. I didn't realize it was, it was him until the owner told me later that, yeah, the guy that was here, that, that was the owner. So that's the entrance to the store and there's, there is the owner. And so there's a lot of stuff in there and it is a um, pretty amazing collection of tools and materials. And if you're into looking for tools or watch parts, although you obviously have to do a lot of looking to find the parts, this is a legendary store. And you'll see it mentioned in a number of internet forums, postings, and blogs on, this is a place where watchmaking students will be brought to at some point during their school period to look for tools and look for materials. And some things are pretty well sorted and organized and other things are just in total disarray. And it's possible that it's solely getting more organized. You know, these are Timing pickups, you know, so I, I have a lot of pictures of this, staking sets, presses, watch keys. I'm guessing that more organized valuable stuff is behind the, uh, the counter. But uh, try and get through all of these uh, as quickly as I can you get the idea a lot of things here that you can only guess what they might be used for others are more obvious so if you are into collecting tools looking for odd tools and odd parts and you get to Switzerland and you want to go to BLBN you want to stop at uh, this store. I could use a few of these, those, those knobs. 
So a lot of hand setting tools and uh, small bench tools, iron lay, iron turns. Dave Cooper collects those sorts of things. Polishers, vacuums, watch cleaning machines, vintage watch exerciser. This is a dial printer. Um, you said that they don't get these in very often anymore and they sell right away. Price on this one was 1300 Swiss francs and it sold. <laughs> um, electric watch winder, never seen one of those before. So it should be coming out of this pretty quickly here and getting on to- I was gonna <laughs> say, Tim, the uh, Chris has been to that place and uh, last year when we were making plans before the pandemic hit, we were, through, we were gonna go through France, Switzerland and into Germany. And I had already exchanged emails with, with Hurley about his, his business hours and uh, making sure that we came on a day that he was going to be open. And I was horribly disappointed, uh, but some of the best tools that I've gotten uh, in, my, uh, in my collections are, have come out of his, his shop. And what's of, of note is, is that he, is, he has absolutely no web presence. He doesn't sell anything via mail order. He, you have to show up in a store if you wanna buy something. I'm not sure that he has even the time to manage a website. Yeah. When I was in the store the last time, there was a group of like five um, Swiss guys huddled around the work around his counter and they were um, digging through things and talking and, and yelling at him and asking him <laughs> questions. And then there was a guy from England who was looking for a certain type of soft rotten polishing stone that he had gotten a chunk of years earlier from Harley and wanted another one and and was you know searching high and low and asking lots of questions and I just talked briefly with the owner and and you know guys were yelling at him and I said I think these guys want your attention he gives his tired sigh goes always <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, Chris has described it as a, a, a completely unorganized candy store. <laughs> it is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, I would go back there in, in a heartbeat, and I don't know if there's any others that are there like that, but I wish they were. Yeah. So um, Switzerland, it's really easy to get around if you're a horological tourist. You can tour many of the factories by arranging a tour. They typically don't charge. And you can get between the various cities by train. You can get a, a pass that is good for basically unlimited travel in a given time frame. You can buy a specific pass to go from point A to point B at a specific time. You can get a pass to go from point A to point B over a duration of time. and on my 2018 trip, that's what I wound up using. I flew into Zurich and attached to the Zurich airport is a, is a main train station and they have a ticket office there. And they speak English uh, very well. They speak all kinds of languages. And I, the guy asked what I was trying to do. And I told him I was trying to go from Zurich to Beale, but I was also going to eventually go on to Chauffons and Laylock and tour, you know, those things. And he says, Well, here's what I will do I will sell you a ticket that goes from Zurich to Laylock and back to Zurich or the Zurich airport, I should say. And it's one ticket, it was a paper ticket. It was good for 10 days because I was going to be there for 10 days. And I could use it on any day for any leg of the trip once. So it wound up working really well. You can also get a an app for their train system on your phone. And I had actually intended to do that, but my phone died on my way there. I lost the cellular radio and I couldn't use my phone. And I had brought a spare phone and I was able to switch the SIMs, but until I figured that out, uh, I was phoneless. So I had to use a paper ticket. So anyway, so this is a rail station for um, BLBN and, uh, they have multiple tracks and there is a tunnel underneath that interconnects the tracks. So you, to get between tracks, you go down in the tunnel. When you go from the airport to Beale, you 
typically you catch a train from the airport to the main Zurich train station, and then you change um, trains at the main Zurich train station. And often the train that you're on is wanting to get to is on an adjacent track. So it's really easy to do it. And here's a countryside uh, going to Beal. These are grapevines. Uh, you don't hear about Swiss wines, but they have a lot of um, acreage under cultivation for wine. But the climate is so cold that their, their production volumes are small and they're almost all consumed within Switzerland. Some people, you know, poo poo them, but I found them pretty fine. <clears throat> so this is um, kind of the main downtown part of, of BLBN close to the train station. And this is from my hotel room uh, on the last time I was there. Across the street is a, a Migros, um, which is their group, one of their big grocery store chains. And that's where I wound up getting some of my food for dinner. The thing about Swiss stores is that they don't have long hours like Americans have, stores have. And so you have to be aware of hour limitations on these things. But being close to train stations and in train stations, there are stores that stay open longer. And uh, this is you know, another view of this building on the left ground building with the rot rotonde on it. They call that the People's House, Folks House. Uh, this was built during a brief period of socialist rule in BLBN, which was in the 30s. They also built a lot of um, communist style housing around the train station. But the, and then the surrounding hillsides of, of BLBN, there, there are, this is the start of the Jura Mountain, and there is a funicular, uh, basically a um, tilted train, fixed track train that goes up and down on the hillside. They have two of them. One goes to their sports arena, the other goes to a hospital. And oftentimes the uh, valley will be socked in with fog because there's a lake nearby. There's a picture, it's a funicular. And, uh, but you go up to the top of the hillside and, and you'll be in sunshine. And this is kind of looking out across the city from the top of the hotel that I was at, which had um, their breakfast room up there. So do a morning. My mornings were spent up there. This was the Rolex manufacturing facility at one point. It's now a assisted living retirement home, probably for old Rolex watchmakers, <laughs> but, but they've kept the sign up. Oh, no, it's it's more than that. Uh, you That is actually Gren's old facility in, in Beale that was acquired. Uh, pretty sure that's it. Interesting. I had no idea. Uh, the Rolex has, has another bigger modern facility where they've uh, combined all of their operations. They used to be spread out uh, around VLBN. They had a micro stamping facility, which made, I think, watch bracelets, which our men Strom is currently in. <clears throat> and this is it at night, where you can see the Rolex sign proudly off in the distance. Rolex is actually headquartered in Geneva. And this was a hotel that I. I stayed at uh, there on the left. That, I stayed at that hotel because I had air conditioning also. And air conditioning is actually not that common in Switzerland. And that particular summer of 2018, they had temperatures over 100 degrees, which is very rare for Switzerland. So this is kind of street level views, walking around, going to get into the old town. They have a mix of pedestrian only streets and streets with cars and streets with electric trolleys and buses. They do have a bus system that you can use to get around and the ticket machines are on the buses. So you walk around BL and you'll see lots of little production facilities. You have no idea what they are but you hear machines going in, inside. <laughs> so, you know, they are making things. And they have rivers that go through the town, but they've been channelized. You know, it's a very kind of industrial looking town. You get into more residential areas, it starts getting more pleasing. And you eventually get into grassy parks and um, 
green spaces that are are kind of nice. And there is a, a lake, a, a lake BL that is close and with lots of wine production around it. And the the, the lake is interconnected with uh, Lake Neuchatel, and that's interconnected to um, the, the lake by Geneva. And you can take a boat between all three lakes. Here we're headed towards Old Town, and they have a historic Old Town with cobble streets. It's kind of built up on a hillside and was walled with historic churches and buildings. This is the coat of arms of BLBN, which is these crossed uh, battle axes. I'm sure there's a name for it. And there's lots of um, these fountains with um, decorative columns in them around the old town. And I don't know what this particular uh, theme was all about, but uh, obviously something between good and evil. You know, my computer is running very slow. This might have been in front of, I believe there had been their old city hall. And I think this was uh, old courthouse because I think that is, she's holding a, a scale of justice, more narrow streets, um, cobblestone. This is again, typical of old town. And her horology Harley is, um, right next to old town any questions <laughs> good to see you all and i will say everybody is for the most part is muted welcome everyone who has joined while i was off rambling and i have enabled screen sharing for everybody and if anybody has anything they want to talk about or share i can do my little spiel if show the kind of stuff that i've got that's omega related if if nobody else wants to jump in first so I think I've, I've showed some of you guys before, I like probably at one of our lunches and stuff, but one of the only, I think it's maybe the only Omega that I, that I have currently is my, my Speedmaster. The, um, it's great. I've used it as a daily, uh, sort of a daily watch for a long time. And the first watch I ever had, the, let's see, when I graduated high school, my mom, she was, she's been in the jewelry business for a long time. And she said, Hey, I'll get you a really nice watch for your, graduation your high school graduation so go ahead and pick out pick out some watch within reason and we'll uh we'll get it because she got a, a discount on a lot of these things and so there were two two things i knew about omega at the time because i i, I kind of liked watches when i was growing up but i you know i wasn't really into watchmaking yet or or fine watches at all my mom had an omega constellation she had one of those like integrated bracelet ones for a long time so i knew it was a, a nice watch and then I knew that um, James Bond, which was Pierce Brosnan at the time when I was growing up, um, had an Omega. So those are the two things that I knew. So I started looking at Omegas. And then I discovered the Moonwatch, which up to that point was, you know, I didn't know anything about. And I started looking through that and I thought, okay, so it's between a, a James Bond Seamaster and a, um, and a, a Speedmaster, a, a Moonwatch. And I think for whatever reason, I felt like the, the moon watch was a little bit more understated because it had kind of a black, it had a black dial as opposed to the, the James Bond, the blue dial with the wave motif and stuff. So I asked for a Speedmaster and she got me, she got me a Speedmaster automatic. And I didn't really know the difference at the time between uh, uh, um, an actual moon watch and, and the Speedmaster automatic, but she got me this one. And I wore it per, like it's 2004. So there you go. So dating myself, that's when I graduated high school. And I wore it very proudly all through college. Uh, after college, I, I moved to New York and I, I wore it as a nice watch all the whole time I lived in New York. And I didn't even know that it, I didn't even know that it wasn't an actual Speedmaster Pro, probably for, you know, all the way through college. And um, it's a, you know, it's very similar in a lot of ways. It's slightly smaller and it has an automatic movement. And then I'll show you the, the comparison actually between the two. Um, well, let's see. And go back to the comparison. So had that watch for a long time and um, I, it was great. So all through college, I worked at Nordstrom out there at the Flatiron Mall, which is now actually since closed, but it was a nice watch to wear when I worked at Nordstrom. And um, I also, it allowed me to sort of start to appreciate watches out in the wild because the Boulder's somewhat wealthy crowd was generally shopping at, at Nordstrom. And so I got to see people's 
um, nice watches and I would usually comment on them when they were, when I was ringing stuff up and I'd say, oh, it's a nice Rolex or, oh, that's a nice Omega. It was the first time I'd seen an Audemars uh, Piguet out in the wild as somebody, a woman came in and she had a nice Royal Oak on and she was flabbergasted that I knew what that was. And she said, oh my God, nobody has ever said anything about my watch. I can't believe you know what this is. I saw a nice Alan Silverstein uh, watch um, out in the wild uh, too there. And same thing, the lady was like, oh my God, I bought this in Paris a few years ago and they were so nice at the store and they brought us into the vault and stuff. So same thing. So um, I had this Speedmaster uh, automatic for a long time and you can see the differences. It's got um, 60 minute track on it and you know it's got different seconds hands and stuff, but it was new, it was very nice. I kept up for a long time. When I moved back from New York and I was in graduate school, I had decided, okay, I'm going to sell my Speedmaster automatic and I'm going to buy a Speedmaster professional. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to commit. And at the time the Speedmasters were still only like, you know, between $1,500 and maybe $2,500 for the nicest one that you could find. And um, so I listed my Speedmaster automatic on eBay and I sold it for $1,500 to a guy in Switzerland, oddly enough. So I shipped it back to Switzerland, <laughs> to Switzerland. And, and I bought this um, Speedmaster Professional to, to replace it. And um, I took a bunch of photos. <clears throat> I guess I bought, the, I bought the Speedmaster Professional first and then I sold the other one. So I had them both at the same time for a small amount of time. I, um, you can see, so when I got this one, I got it from a nice, a nice lady, a nice older lady in New Jersey, in Tom's River, which is where um, I was actually born. I grew up in Long Branch before my parents moved to Colorado. So it's just the, the town next to Long Branch. And it belonged to her husband who had, who had passed away and he was a doctor and he was given this as a gift. At some point, she didn't remember if it was a patient or if it was an award for something, but I bought it because it was in really good shape and it, you know, it came with the box and, and I liked the story, the fact that it was kind of right by where I was from in New Jersey and she was very nice to deal with. And, um, and it was in great shape. You know, she said he hardly wore it. He kept it in the box in the dresser and he didn't wear it very often. And at the time I was looking at buying a, a, a three, two, one, I really wanted one of the earlier ones. And um, I had a couple opportunities to really buy some nice ones. And I just passed them up because it just, it didn't feel right. I think I wanted one that was a little bit that I wouldn't be so precious about because even then the three, two ones were starting to get pretty valuable. And, and I knew I just wanted something to wear daily, but I didn't want one of the modern ones. So I did that. I started looking at the transitional, the transitional um, eight, six ones as well. That still had like the pipe, the stepped dial and the applied logo. Um, but actually had the 861 movement. So I almost bought a couple of those too, but same thing. They just, they were always maybe a hundred dollars more than I wanted to spend, which was enough to keep me from doing anything. So anyway, the price was right on this one. I think I paid $2,100 for this when I got it in 2012. And you can see the, the box still has the price tag on it. So it was a $250 watch when it was sold, which I thought was, <laughs> which is just ridiculous. Um, they came with the, the little, you know, pamphlet on it, which kind of shows how the functions work and stuff like that. Oddly enough, the one that they show is a flat link three, two, one. It still has the stick second hand and stuff on it. But um, so it came with that, <clears throat> came with the outer box and the inner box, which was actually kind of like one of the ones you had, you had taken a photo of uh, Tim in, in the museum. It has like wood paneling, you know, like faux yep. wood paneling, which was very, <laughs> very, you know, popular at the time. I, I've never actually dated this because I've never opened it. Um, never opened the watch. So I don't know exactly when it's from. I'm, the woman I bought it from guessed it was either late seventies or, or kind of early to mid eighties. Um, so this is the, what came with it. It came with the, the links that I had removed, still had the original little pad in there and then the Omega Speedmaster and then the moon watch. So it's got that wood paneling on the case. So um, I just thought that was really cool. And then the watch itself is um, is nice. It has it's got um, teeth, Swiss made teeth, so it's tritium on there, and it, and it's kind of aged very evenly in the second hands and stuff. And it's not it's not too scratched up. It looks pretty close to a new one um, for the most part. And 
and um, it's got the original 1171 band on there, which is nice. And it's it's rattly, you know, like the end links on these things. It kind of rattles when you wear it and stuff. But I, I sort of find that charming. Um, the, the the brushing and the polishing and stuff's all in good shape. And, and it has the one of the things I always liked about the vintage ones is it has the tapered band. So it actually I like stainless steel bands, but they can they can be a little heavy and they can they can wear a little rough too. But the tapering on vintage ones relieves a lot of that stress on the underside of your arm. So, um, which I think is interesting if you guys follow the new you know Omega News and stuff. They've now since released a new you know, standard moon watch and they went back to a, a tapered bracelet as opposed to the one that's been on there for the last twenty years as a it's the same thickness of the clasp that it is at the, the lugs. So yeah, that's the, and that's the back. And it's unfortunate because the prices have, have gone up, you know, on these things to the, to sort of the tune of me, not really thinking this is as much of a, an a easy daily wear as it used to be, unfortunately. <laughs> so, but I really, I really like it. It keeps, it keeps amazing time, but unfortunately, you know, I don't know the service history on it. I've never had it serviced. I'm worried to get it serviced because I know Speedmasters, they're notorious for um, the paint on the hands chipping. If a, you know, if a careless watchmaker is a little bit rough when they take the hands off. And so a lot of time the hands will get replaced when they service them, even at Omega, even if you give them to Omega. So I don't want that because these are presumably the original hands with the with the original matching tritium loom on the on the dial and stuff. So I'll have to get it serviced at some point. It runs really well. I try not to beat up on it too much. And I I would service it myself if I was just a small amount, if I was just a little bit braver, but I don't think i I don't think I have the constitution to to actually do it myself. So and with that I've never opened it either. So I don't actually know the serial number or the the reference number uh, directly because I've never I've never had it open. It's just kind of a little time capsule uh, in my mind. And there's the 1171 stainless steel band, and um, yeah, that's the box that it came in. So that's my. my so on those those series of, of watches at that time, they weren't engraving the serial number on the lugs yet. Um, because I, I don't see anything on the lug. And it's really small laser engraving on the modern ones. Yeah, I, I doubt it because I've only ever, the, the, the 633 is the end link, you know, which is on the Yeah, end. yeah. The, then, uh, the, the box, uh, that tag on the box doesn't have a, a number on it. It doesn't have the reference. The only other thing it has on there is the, um, yeah, that one. It, it's like you don't, a, Sean, you don't know if it's a dash 74 or 76 or 78. You don't, you don't know what the, the extension is the okay i don't i i mean it has the trapezoid 1171 bracelet mm -hmm. um you know the omega on the bracelet is in a trapezoid instead of a square mm -hmm. so that means it's from the 70s is that what you believe that's that's what i i think I, yeah I imagine it's well so she didn't tell you when it was purchased or okay yeah, she didn't know exactly. She thought it was late. She thought it was sometime in the late seventies or early. Yeah. So after that, they the the eleven seventy one bracelets have a square around the omega instead of a trapezoid. So that does put it in, you know, the seventies, but not the seventy one because that's that still would have had a step dial. Okay. So it would be like seventy four, seventy six, seventy eight. Those are the model numbers. You know, the reference numbers after one forty five oh two two. So it's in there somewhere, is my guess. Okay. Um, Bruno has serviced several of these, you know, 861 Speedmasters for me. Mm -hmm. It's never been a problem. Okay, Bruno, all right. Sean, that was a great story. Thanks for sharing that. All those connections, that's what makes a watch so special. Yeah, thanks. It, um, yeah, I've been happy with it. It's, it's, you know, it's a great watch. Just the Speedmaster has always just been a good, it's kind of like the prototypical wash in a lot of ways. And it itself has a lot of history to it. So yeah, I got this book. I know the the Christmas after my mom gave me the watch, she gave me this book, the Omega Designs book. And um, that has a lot of cool stuff in it as well. That was the thing that kind of drove drove my passion. And I I, I started buying up the little speed, you know, uh, Seamasters dress watches and stuff when I was in college and kind of messing around with those because at the time they were like you know you could get them for a hundred bucks a piece for the really nice ones and 
So I had a lot of those, but I, I sold them over the years. And I had a nice, uh, I had a nice World War One Omega for a long time too that I, I sold a few years ago, and now I kind of always regret it. I don't know why I did that. That was one of the first watches I bought that I really loved, that I was able to work on myself, and had to uh, had to sort of repair it and find parts over the years and stuff. And a couple of years ago, I was just kind of cleaning out my collection, and I thought, oh, I haven't really done anything with that watch in a long time. And and then. Uh, more recently I've been collecting more World War One watches and so now I see these pictures and I just kick myself I was like why did I I got you know 300 bucks for it or something like that when I sold it on eBay which is which is fine it's just you know they just don't come up all that often so and I'd probably have to pay double that to get another one so they have that nice engraving on the back and and uh that was that case uh that third party case yeah it's a um <clears throat> a phase uh sterling silver case and uh, it, I was told that, okay, yeah, it was the third party, right? So you'd go to the jewelry store and if you wanted something nicer than the Omega one, then you could buy the, the phase was a, was a common one. And I've, I've actually had a couple of these and I've had a couple uh, uh, Patria ones as well that came in a very similar case. Um, so I like Sterling Silver. I'm, I started in what I started getting into watches because of jewelry. So I have all the tools and stuff to fix Sterling Silver. And uh, I still do a lot of Sterling Silver work and stuff. So that was kind of what attracted me to some of these old third party cases and was that I could when they're broken, um, I can I can generally fix them. So but yeah, that's my uh, my story for today. Thank you guys for listening. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's very nice. The uh, comments about not sending uh, the watch back to Omega is has been something that a lot of people have have echoed on a lot of the online forums they will replace things that even though you tell them don't replace it hands you know particularly the hands early um, coaxial movements in their first edition mm -hmm. they will replace those with a, a later version if you send an early coaxial omega in for factory servicing they just take the movement out and put a different one in and that is just not acceptable uh, for a lot of collectors. So yeah. a lot of people say, don't, don't do it. Don't send it to Omega. Yeah. There's the, um, well, I forget what the nice jewelry store is down at Cherry Creek. Um, Hyde Park. Yeah. Hyde Park. The um, one of the women I worked with at Nordstrom, she had, she'd moved over to Hyde Park at some point and she's one of the, like one of the, you know, people there and, I went down and spoke with her and the watchmaker down there a few years ago asking, you know, about servicing and stuff. And I had Hyde Park uh, service in Omega for me, which Terry Jones now owns the Omega Dynamic. Um, I thought they did a good job. They were expensive. <clears throat> yeah, I went down last time I was down there at the Omega boutique. I was I was wearing this and the, the salesperson did. They stopped me and they said, they said, oh, wow, that must be like an that's an older one. Because look at the they said it's got tritium loom. You can see how it's aged on there. So the salesperson knew enough to to sort of point that out. I thought that was kind of nice. But yeah, it's cool. The Omega boutique that's like right next to the the high that's attached to the Hyde Park one is Yep. It's, they usually have some cool stuff on display if you go down there. Yeah, I've 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 been down there. I've I've grabbed you know I'll, I'll go there and grab magazines and stuff occasionally from them, the Omega Times or whatever they call it. But mm -hmm. yeah, well, when Jim, I was, uh, this is Terry. Uh, that's a nice segue. I happen to have the Omega Dynamic here in my lap that I bought from you, and I wanted to tell a little bit about it. Excuse my raspy voice. I had the uh, vaccine shot a couple of days ago and left me with the headache for a day and a uh, little fever Monday night, but otherwise I'm recuperating, but I have a little sinus drainage. As a preface, Tim, I wanted to thank you for mentioning in your last email to us that it might be more compatible if we bought a headset to cut down background noise and to enable everyone to hear me better. So I went to my local Best Buy and paid about $20 for this headset. And I hope you'll agree that the sound is coming through good and I'm hearing you guys much better. I thank you for that tour of Switzerland. I was last in Switzerland in 1963 before I ever got interested in watches and clocks. And now under the current circumstances, I think we're all very um, 
happy with the fact that we've seen the country and done the touring that we've done because we don't know when we may be able to do it again right now with the, uh, with the COVID. Anyway, if you can see this Omega, it is, does that show up okay? Yes. This is the Omega Dynamic. Uh, it was released in 1997. I found a website on the internet called www.watchcollectinglifestyle.com. And originally it had the stainless steel bracelet, which I of course saved. I wanted to go to a leather hand stitched bracelet, which I found from a leather band place in England. So I added that to the watch. This description quotes this guy. Um, in reality, it's hard to believe how this beautiful military inspired chronograph got discontinued less than three years after its launch. It is estimated that no more than 8,000 third generation Omega Dynamics were ever sold at a very affordable price tag of 1,000. 550 Swiss francs. He goes on on the last page to uh, describe the movement. Uh, the beating heart inside the Omega Dynamic is the automatic Omega Caliber 1138, which is an ETA based movement with the Dubois de Prez 2030 chrono module on top. The caliber beats at a frequency of 28,800 VPH and is fitted with 44 joules instead of 45 and bears the engraving of the ETA shield logo with caliber number 2890A2 next to an Omega logo. Opposed to what other orology experts say, this is a quote from this guy on this website, this caliber is a workhorse and smooth as butter when operating the chronograph. Additionally, upon opening the watch, we found that between the case back and the movement, there's an additional protective casing that could very well ensure anti-magnetic protection. The watch is water resistant to a depth of 50 meters or 150 feet. So that's uh, my uh, first and only chronograph purchase and I'm Proud to say I have a nice Omega, thanks to Tim. Yeah, I've always loved those. The um, the the earlier dynamics I thought were really cool because they're very like they're very 70s um, inspired, right? And I've always loved those. And then I remember back in college discovering the the dynamic chronographs, and they were really affordable. Like you could get them on eBay for, you know. Seven hundred dollars, six hundred dollars, you know, under a thousand dollars at the time. Which, and I always thought they looked really cool. They got that yellow seconds hand, and and they got kind of like the Breguet numeral stuff like that. I, was, I never ended up getting one. That was more money than I ever had when I was in college. But the um, I always really liked those. That's a cool watch. I think when I had originally bought that watch, I bought it at at an auction, and I think I paid thirteen hundred for it, possibly. Didn't have the box, but it had the, the original bracelet on it. And the bracelet was a folded bracelet. You know, the metal clips or the metal pieces were folded and they had the seams right at the skin level. And they would grab your hairs and rip them off your wrist. It was, you know, really amazing on how well they could snag your hair. But I liked the Arabic numerals and the numerals themselves were yellow like the the hands were they had a, an aged look to it and even recently on i don't know if it was hodinky or one of the websites they did a retro spec on this watch and a lot of people still trashed it over its looks and i i just don't understand why yeah he uh, he describes that uh, a little bit on this second page it's beautiful matte black dial features brigade style arabic numerals with luminescent material a running seconds register at three, a 30 minute chrono register at nine o'clock with yellow accents on the three, six and nine minute markers and a yellow hand, a white minute second, one fifth of a second chapter ring with yellow accents, yellow chrono seconds hand and sword military hands 
with luminescent material. The registers on the dial are slightly recessed to add dimension and greater depth at the field. Regardless of the many elements on the dial, this dial is well balanced and doesn't feel cluttered or busy at all. And of course, it's got the sapphire uh, crystal. <clears throat> I think it's kind of interesting. The as I, I, you know, I look at design in sort of all sorts of realms, and I feel like this watch is it's it feels somewhat fanciful, and I think that's a product of it being like a '90s, early 2000s kind of you know age piece of design, and I feel like right now that stuff doesn't sit very well in the sort of culture of overall design and I think history kind of drags this weight behind it and eventually these time periods become more accepted like nobody used to like you know mid-century modern if there was a, lo a long time mid-century modern was just old buddy-duddy kind of design and then that's become very vogue again and it, it'll be the same it's starting to be the same thing with like brutalism and uh and postmodernism too and i kind of think this watch sort of falls into that time period that sort of postmodern time period which has been panned for a long time but is starting to gain more appreciation in the in sort of the um the eyes of of people looking back and and i feel like that watch this watch the the playful design of it kind of falls into that. So I'm wondering if it just hasn't hit its heyday yet, but I've always thought it was really kind of a fun watch. And the fact that it's always been sort of accessible from a price point, it's a pretty heavy duty, pretty heavy duty watch for, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of value there, I guess. I would agree with that. Dan, did you uh, sell your two uh, pre-moon Speedmasters that uh, you had listed? I got, I sold one of them, um, just shipped it off yesterday. But I still have four. <laughs> um, the, um, but I could share a few, a few things. Yeah, I thought I would actually start with some earlier things because Tim talked about these 30 millimeter caliber watches in his tour, the 30 Cal 30, 30 T1, T2. These are, um, so, you know, these were, you know, like a second, third generation of hand winding movements that Omega made and um, very successful. I mean, I think they probably started in the late thirties and didn't end until the sixties, you know, different versions of them. And they were originally called Cal 30 and then 32 was quite famous throughout the forties. And they made different versions, including the chronometer grade one that I think Tim showed in his slides. And then they, when they started making shock protected versions, they transitioned to a different nomenclature where they called them caliber 260 and then 265, 266, 267, and then up into the 280s, which were sort of center second driven. And they were very um, robust watches for a long time. And so this one is from the white dials from the late forties. It's one of the early uh, shock protected versions with uh, Inca block. I didn't actually open the back of this one, uh, but this one came in a pretty large case. And so, uh, but this one is just a little later from the early fifties. And my wife has actually appropriated this from me. So I had to go get it out of her jewelry box to show it. Uh, but, um, you know, there's some degradation to the black dial as it always happens with these, but it's still it's still really appealing. She likes it. I opened the back of this one so you can see. So yeah, so so this you see is called a 265 is the is the caliber on this, but really it's basically identical to the shock protected version of the 30 T2 with the sub dial. And um and uh yeah, so they 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 continue to make these through for a long time. Oh, and I guess I'll just point out for collectors. You know, inside these case backs, there's a reference number very often. Like, so you'll see 2639 is the case reference uh, for this with uh, the batch number, you know, five um, people call those different things. But um, yeah, so I, you know, in inside this other watch is basically the identical movement. It's just, it would just be called, because this was actually, it has a shock protected version. So, so those are the 230. Yeah, so they just call them 30 millimeter movements. You know, they just had various sort of names over the years. I also, I, you know, it's funny that the, the 
fifties and, you know, it was such a popular time. Um, Sean was talking about all the Seamasters. It seems to be like a period of time that people love to collect, but that's like the time I don't have anything uh, from Omega, but I have this Seamaster 300 dive watch, automatic winding dive watch from the early sixties, um, which I had restored. I like it, um, but it, it was kind of in, in bad shape when I, when I got it, the, these, um, bezel inlay was originally Bakelite and they're almost always destroyed. And so I had that one restored by someone who specializes in that. Uh, so not one of the most collectible pieces, but nice, nice to wear. Um, and you may, people may recognize if you're familiar with the early Speedmasters, before the Speedmaster professionals that Sean showed, they had almost identical case, like it's basically the same lug style but in a chron with, for a chronograph, the same size. So th these were the early Seamaster dive watches were in the same, basically the same mid case as the speed, the Speedmasters prior to them being Speedmaster professionals. I didn't, I didn't open this one. It's, it's got like a caliber 560 something. I'm blanking on what it is. And then I can add um, a little bit of perspective to the Speedmaster professional story two so the you know sean was was mentioning a little bit they they transitioned to these you know as opposed to those um sort of straight lugs like like the similar one for this seamaster in the mid 60s or early mid 60s they transitioned to these kind of curved lug design and then they started putting professional on the dial and as tim mentioned these you know these uh, NASA published some specs for astronauts to wear the watches and um, a few, I guess Wittenauer was one of the other ones uh, that was in the finalist group. And, and yeah, they had various problems. And so the Speedmaster won out. And th these, these four watches all span a few years, like from 66 to 70. And they're all called, um, you know, collector circles. They, they we'll call them um, pre-moon speedmasters because they have these case back that um, just sort of has. It's just a hippocampus seahorse type of design. Whereas if you remember Sean's, it had the um, NASA printing on the back. The you know NASA certified for uh, <laughs> space flight. Um, and, and so they, they, you know, interestingly, they, you know, after the first moon landing, they started making those case backs, but the ones that were actually worn on the moon were these earlier ones, because those are the ones that they gave out to the astronauts that ended up like, you know, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, the ones that actually went in those early Apollo missions. And, and they're just very subtle differences between the dials and the cases, but they also have different movements. So I actually opened these and pulled the dust cover so you can see. So these are all based on a Lanya design. You know, throughout the, throughout most of the 60s, the, the caliber 321 was used. It's the one here on the left with the column wheel. And um, you can see, you know, some, significant similarities in the overall layout and design, but in the um, final version before the moon landing, they switched to a cam operated version called the Caliber 861. And, um, and then that's the one they used for decades. Although, you know, there were minor tweaks to call it a 1861 and a more decorated 3861 that's used with um, display case back versions uh, and, and, um, you know, so, and, and, and Sean's would have this same, uh, the one on the right would be the same, exactly the same caliber that Sean has in his. That's actually, that's cool to see them side by side. I, you know, it's been a little while since I've looked up a photo of and, and seen them side by side like that. The three, two, one is definitely a more attractive kind of movement from a historical watchmaking standpoint, but the 861 has its, has charm as well, but yeah, that's, that is cool. You're, this is a random question, but do you have, do you have like a nice case back opener or do you just have like a general one that you're careful with? Um, it's just a general one. I mean, I, it's like a, it's a good one. I, I have a, like an LG, uh, wrench 
that I okay. that I use. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm pretty like what I try to do is I will um, I usually put the watch itself in a holder so that I'm not trying to grip it in my fingers. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'll put it in a in in, in a, like a you know one of those four post jaw holders so that it's firmly held and I'll just try to get a good look at it. Yeah, but that's all I have. I don't have like a big press type. I mean, I have one for Rolex, but I don't use that for, yeah, that's, yeah, that's similar to what I have. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, this is what uh, you use, Sean, to hold it. So you, you get one of these yeah. and you yeah. clamp mm -hmm. it in a vise. Um, so I've got this on a vise and then you push down super hard on, on the case wrench. You can also, um, L LG sells a little clamping thing that with a screw on it that you can put your uh, watch into, but it's kind of limited in size and I'll show you. You can also put these wrenches inside a press. I mean, you can mount the, I mean, it depends how, I do have a press that I can mount this and keep it from slipping. Yeah, I've got, that's, ba that's basically what I do. I've got the four jaw, I've got the four jaw holder that I'll put in my little vise and I've got sort of the three, I, my wrench, I, I should probably buy one of the, one of the nicer wrenches that you're, that you're talking about. I have a couple of just like the cheaper ones, which are, they work, they definitely work. And when you put it in the jaws and in a vise and stuff like that, and you're careful with it and everything is, I find it to work. I just, I really just don't want to slip. So I was curious if I actually needed to buy one of the press ones, or if you guys felt with a decent wrench and holding everything that con you're confident enough that, you, you know, that's how you guys do yeah, it. Yeah. So. I mean, you know, you can buy um, those presses, you know, with the silicone um, discs mm. that are, you know, you, 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 it's just a friction fit that um, I think watchmakers very frequently will use those because they're, um, you know, they basically are zero risk and, you know, they can slip, but they're, you know, they're, they have a pretty strong, a pretty strong grip in, inside one of the presses, but, you know, that whole setup is at least a thousand dollars, I think. To, to, <laughs> yeah. To buy. I think, I think if you want to, um, if you're doing gold cases in particular, you want to use the friction stuff because gold is so fragile. Mm -hmm. um, this is, uh, the accompanying um, holder uh, or clamp for the uh, LG um, style. Um, so there's, um, show you this little pin on the end. Yeah. That thing engages on, on the back of the wrench. And so you yeah. can squeeze this down and there's a little bit of a, of a spring that adds some tension to it. Yeah. The big problem with these things is that this part doesn't work with big cases very much. And I actually took mine apart and put it on my milling machine and milled it out some. But, um, you know, Horotech is the the value priced brand is, if such thing exists in Switzerland uh, for tools. Um, and you can get dedicated dies or heads that have the pins at the exact correct with, you know, spacing and all of that for specific watches yeah it's the age-old question of how much money to spend on the tools versus how much to spend on the, the watches themselves so that's cool i was yeah i was curious how you guys do it and i think everybody has a different tolerance for risk like you were saying dan if there's like i'm probably more in like the zero i have zero tolerance for risk so happy to see how other people are doing things well you can practice on a cheap watch yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not too bad. It's still, it's just that, that, that threat, that threat of yeah. slipping is enough to keep me from opening some of my watches. Yeah. <clears throat> so the uh, uh, comments on the, the two movements that Dan showed the uh, 321 versus the 861, the 861 is the base movement that's also used in the flight masters. Um, the flight masters just had the added um, secondary GMT hand function on it, and they uh, on the on the first flight master with the split green black little sub dial. That was a 24 hour edition, 
and the later versions they changed that to a running seconds because the first one didn't have a running seconds and that bothers some people if they don't know that their watch is actually running I always just run the chronograph so i know it's running and were two were two of yours did two of yours have the applied logo and then the other two had the painted logo but all yeah. of them were the stepped dial um yeah that's right so the the 321 movement models are some of the subtle differences that Sean is talking about. Um, this guy applied metal logo, the, the, the Omega symbol is, is metal. And then later they just changed to painted. And there's a sort of a pie pan shape to the dial. Is it an, 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 I want to show, cause we talked about this with Longines, um, and Tim even showed it in his tour was the um, archive, right? When you did the Longines tour, you showed the archive. And so uh, Omega has an archive too. And, and you can request uh, extract. <laughs> um, typically it's only the kind of thing you would do if the watch itself is valuable enough that you, know, you think it's gonna be important to have some sort of uh, you know, add some credibility to it. Not that it authenticates the watch, but at least it will connect the serial number to the reference number and the date and where it was, where it was delivered. So did uh, you broke up a little bit uh, during that, but did they, did they charge for the extracts? Yeah. Yeah, they do. They, they charge like, I think it's like $150 for these, which is why I was saying that that's not something you do for at least I don't do it for every watch. Whereas with long jeans, every long jeans I get, I just ask for an extract because they're free. But I'm very selective about bothering to request an extract for, for Omega. Nice. That's cool. I mean, it, yeah, they put it on, that's embossed paper. So that's probably, you know, that's $150 right there. <laughs> well, they, you know, yeah, so, they it's five, $500 yeah. for, for a brigade. So anyway, sorry, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to walk on you. <laughs> <laughs> they, they they actually made a, a slight change to that process recently so i'm not sure if it's exactly i know the price is the same but i don't know what they're actually sending you the, these days in the mail nice yeah you got quite the little uh quite the little family there dan that's nice right, right. <laughs> well as tim was saying i felt like i had too big a family so i'm i, I did sell one recently i'm selling another two well you got to make room for some more in the collection right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'll I'll do a share screen on um, so so this is a, a three twenty one um, Omega center second chronometer version probably the same size as as the larger one that Dan had shown. I'll zoom in on this one. This one went to Omega New York and was 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 serviced and refinished in twenty eleven by previous owner and unfortunately they redid the dial as well so that kind of ruined the value of it but um it's the uh, chronometer movement on it and the difference between the chronometer movements and and um non-chronometer movements is this regulator on on the balance which is a little uh, fancier than than the regular uh, non-chronometer version ones but this one they also refinished the case on it and between the lugs they did a pretty poor job on it get a closer look at the dial so i mean the dial's not not a bad redone they even added swiss made on it but it's obviously a redone and they give you they show you all the parts that they replace and they they give you the parts back so uh, some people that send their flight masters in for service they they replace you know all kinds of of, of things but um you know mainspring and and i think that little pin there in the in the middle with the little pointy or the the, the little that thin piece of, of metal there is the friction spring for the center sweep. And just as a 
show you the receipt for it. Uh, you know, they, they talk about all, all the things that issues, um, the movement shows signs of water damage and the dial is stained. They say the dial could remain in current condition, but they went ahead and uh, redid it all. And the uh, estimated time frame, 20 to 24 weeks, and they charged a little over $1,000 uh to do it and the the movement uh obviously is is kind of dirty looking compared to something that is cleaned up so they obviously didn't try and do anything with the surface finish of of the movement they just replaced some of the mechanical parts on it and redid the dial and regrained the case yeah so. watch service is is funny like that it's both less expensive than you would think but also very expensive just in general like it's the, the amount of time that it takes to do that stuff, you almost wonder sometimes how they can do it for that. But at the same time, it's like you buy a watch for sometimes for, you know, a thousand bucks and it's going to cost a thousand dollars to get it running. It's like shh, crap. So, yep. Anthony, anything on your end, uh, Mega Wise? Uh, I know Australia has got a ton of Omega stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely large collector group of things here. Um, yeah. Not really anything personally on my side um but yeah it's really super popular brand um yeah they've just probably about 12 months ago upgraded the local boutique and things uh which is quite nice um and yeah uh, like everywhere else in the world it's definitely one of the the top brands um you know probably focus on the speedy is the most obvious thing you see but yeah the other models Definitely still see kicking around. Um, and yeah, fairly strong collecting scene in Australia for those. I bought a number of parts from a company called Watch Co Australia on eBay. And I think Watch A Do maybe is another one. Um, mm -hmm. But there, there just seems to have been a huge stockpile of Omega parts that uh, were in that part of, of the hemisphere. And um, I think, Omega even got offended by some of the stuff that they were doing. They were putting together some watches uh, from pieces that Omega had custom seized. Yeah, yeah, there was definitely a huge stockpile of spare parts and things. As you say, people were essentially putting together complete watches and selling them off as, you know, they were essentially as new, like literally all of the parts came together, but yeah, they were never shipped from the company. Um, but yeah, you get a full movement, you get a dial, you get all the hands, you get everything, put it all together. Um, and then they were selling those off. So um, local market, definitely a lot of spare parts and things. But that seems to have dried up a bit. You don't see it as much locally. There's still you know, a few things kicking around, but yeah, you don't see the whole complete watches and things being sold these days. Again, uh, the story that I had read was they they weren't pitching these as official omega watches they they were no. they were telling them what they were but yeah omega that was got, straight up about it omega got wind of it and shut it down but i have bought a number of watch uh, bracelet from from australia for some of my marine chronometers and and uh speed sonic lobster type watches so yeah that, they were definitely clear that you know these were not shipped from the factory as completed now putting it together i think the concern was just people then purchasing them and on selling them, pretending that they were original. So yeah, they got into a bit of a problem there. So yeah, yeah sure. I think uh, they got a call from a few lawyers and yeah, stopped. So are you exclusively Japanese pieces then, Anthony? Yeah, pretty much it's the focus. I started yeah. looking at other things and went, you know what, it's too slippery a slope. I don't need to go down there. I've got enough problems where I am. So I'll just stick on the Japanese side. Nice. Nice. There's definitely something to specializing, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it'll fit on the camera, but yeah, when we were just jumping back talking about case openers, um, just got one of these. Um, yeah, comes down, you've got the different pieces that fit in, hold the case there um, and securely get it. Uh, there's a few different versions around, but yeah, it's handy. Good for those cases that really are totally locked in because you've got a nice big handle on the top you can get a good lot of grip so yeah okay. seized up cases it definitely comes in handy and yeah quite easy to control but yeah, yeah you see people with those you know little stupid two-prong opener things and holding it in their hand and just uh, and a disaster waiting to happen 
<laughs> is that an Asian import? Uh, yeah, that's a cheap Asian one. I think I paid like, I don't know, a hundred bucks or something. But yeah, there's a um, this Bergeron version, which is yeah, a lot more. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, um, that should be good enough. But what it is, it works okay. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The, the tolerances are fine on it. It's actually reasonably well built. Um, yeah, bottom, yeah, it all comes together quite well. There's a whole bunch of different tips and stuff on it. So for what it is, works all right. That's that's what I was envisioning. That's what I thought, like, at what point do you sort of, as a collector or as a, you know, as, a, as a, an enthusiast, do you jump from you know to, to something more like that it's interesting that that's that that is an asian import one that, that you think is actually that, that yeah like, i i yeah. mean it uses the same tips as the version on everything it's yeah okay. it's a straight up copy yeah, yeah. I, I picked that up in hong kong probably 10 years ago so i'm sure they're still kicking around there i would think that you could find them on ebay and and honestly oh, sure. the you know it's not a high precision lathe you're you're it's more of a brute force tool. And I think that the Asian imports are fine. And I think a lot of things that come out that are labeled Bergeon or Horatech are coming out of uh, factories in like uh, India. And it's, it's not like there's something special with, with Swiss made in, in some things that they're doing. Pin vices, case opener, frames like that. You know, I think you can do just fine with the imports. All right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's good to yeah. see. I just avoid the super, super cheap ones. Um, Cause yeah, you see a lot out of India where the casting seems to be made out of just random old tins and other crap they melted down and like just complete rubbish. Um, but yeah, if you buy it in a reasonable amount of money, you know, um, but yeah, you don't have to go crazy spending thousands on an opener unless you're doing it every day for your work. Okay, cool. That's yeah, that's good to know. I know. <clears throat> when you go to the the jewelry store, you know, or or you you see the fast fix jewelry at the mall or something like that, right? The little watchmaking bench and stuff. They usually have that next level of tool for change, just for ultimately for changing batteries and stuff like that, you know. But it's it's like I don't know if I can justify <laughs> like how many cases am I opening? But at a certain point, that's you know, it it's not a bad investment. So. It's cool. It's cool it's just to see what everybody uses. Well, we are going on a little after two o'clock at this point. So that would be two hours for you folks. Shall we, uh, anybody have anything else they want to share or bring up at this point? Or I would thank you all for attending. Any uh, thoughts on what you'd want to do on, a, on next month's meeting from a theme, mm -hmm. thematic standpoint? I just got a, um, a Pulsar back from being uh, worked on like a, a, a P2. Um, so I might show that next time. Um, so I don't know if there's a theme built around, you know, LEDs or 70s or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know. Either way, I was, I, there's something, I'm, every time I look at it, I smile. So I'll, show, I'll, I'll hold off, but I'll, I'll show it to you guys next time. That's good. Um, quartz is certainly reasonable. It's, it makes up a big, fraction of my collection and being an electrical engineer I th always think I can fix them is a mixed bag but uh, <laughs> th that would be fun so we can certainly do something like that a combination digital watch 70s styling theme sort of event all right so everybody stay healthy then and thanks for organizing Tim this is great you yeah, bet cool glad, glad to do it